I wanted to have you uh, have you back now, both both because it's been too long, and also because uh, your book, which I believe is actually your very first book, um, I remember uh, years and years ago when I was teaching at Rutgers, uh, getting it out of the Rutgers library to uh, take a look at it, and I posted a picture of the library book, and I think you told me that was your first uh, that was your very first book, um, and uh, and it is yeah, this I, book, I, yeah, as, as long as. I uh, it's the book I wrote the book forty years ago. Okay, how's that for a thought? I mean, <laughs> what are you? Are you like forty years old yourself? Wait a minute. Uh, I I am uh, forty two. So oh, there you go. Okay, but well, you got the idea. And the yeah. book first came out in the winter of eighty four, eighty five, um, and I I was fortunate. It remained in 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 print for a long time, and then another publisher bought the book again in. It was Macmill the first publisher was Basil Blackwell Polity Press. Neither one of the Polity Press still exists, right? Um, then in the mid '90s, the second edition with the Hobbsbaum forward came out with Macmillan, which is Saint, Mar which was or at least has been Saint Martin's in this country. Mm -hmm. And then, in order to accord uh, our dear friend or late dear friend Michael due credit, it was in a. Um, it was in a conversation with Michael during one of the breaks or between the show and a, and a post game where he said that I asked him if he was working on anything and he talked about zero books, yeah. both of our publishers now. Mm -hmm. And I produced a collection of, of my essays for them. Take, take I remember that. history. And then Doug Lane had talked about the possibility with me of bringing out yet again, because the rights had reverted to me of th this book, the British Marxist historians. So if anyone picks it up, they'll see that it has three prefaces, 84, 96, I guess it is. And then 2021, 2022. Yeah. It's kind of, it's just daunting. I, I had to reread the book in order to, for it to come out. And I have to say, I don't know if you'll appreciate it in the same way. Well, I'm going to say this, but I didn't realize how analytical once upon a time I was. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> and I don't know if it's my age or just because history made me sort of tune me into a whole different set of uh, ways of thinking. I'm just not quite as analytical as I was at that time in any conscious and deliberate way. Yeah. Well, of course I like that, but uh, about the, about the book, uh, but um but yeah, this is. Uh, I, I want to get into the the meat of uh, of some of what you uh, what you say in it, of course. But but I also think uh, you know I also do want to just talk a little bit about how you uh, how you got into the subject originally, right? I mean, because because I think if I'm remembering correctly from uh, other interviews I've seen with you, I think you actually you started out uh, studying Latin American. Uh, yeah, students, my, all, almost all three of my degree as a, as a high school exchange student in South America, and it just fascinated me. And I, my undergraduate degree was in history. My graduate degree is in basically in politics, international politics at the University of London. And there I had a minor subject in agrarian studies. And the fellow who was, it was the title he had was lecturer, but that would be like an assistant professor in this country who was um, decidedly a Marxist. And one day he said to me, uh, you know, you know more about Latin America than any of our British students do, but you don't know how to make an argument. You'll, mm. okay. And I, and I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, he said, you're not, you're not thinking theoretically in any way. You're not bringing questions to bear on things. And he gave me an assignment for the three week, the long break in winter, the Christmas holidays. And, had to do with are Latin American rural workers, are they proletarian or peasant? Simple question. And he, mm -hmm. based on land tenure studies that, that were done. And I could, and that was the beginning, especially after that, where I really came to understand that what I was looking at in, for lack of a better way of putting it, Marxian terms. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, I actually left and I did my PhD. When I came back to the States, I ended up going from LSE to LSU and, and, at Louisiana State University, I was in a, in a I was in a sociology program, and and I did Latin America as a as my overall thesis and and or dissertation in this country. But what was interesting is that I didn't quite know how to. I was using terminology 
that was seemingly Marxist, but it was mm. based on Andre Gunder Frank's work on dependence theory on Latin America, which it was an attack on the more traditional modernization kinds of stuff. I knew a dual society and all that. And this was the age in which mo modern world systems emerged. Mm. And, and I, it's a funny little story. If anybody's doing any graduate work themselves, they might get a kick out of this. I had gone to Mexico in the summer of 75 and I, as a graduate student and took undergraduates to Mexico to study. And when I came back, I had a new office mate and a guy who I became very, very good friends with. And he was hearing what I was saying to him about what I was working on for my dissertation. This was, again, I was pretty sure it was summer 75. Or anyhow, he says to me, so what does exploitation mean? I was using this term. What does that mean? And my answer was so, so fucking inadequate, absolutely inadequate, that I kind of freaked out. I mean, he, I'm not, I, I'm not sure he was upset at all, but I was upset with myself. And I, I'm making a story out of this, but it is the no, case. I, I went off campus to this little bookstore, which had a lot of. It was a, a, a bookstore that I don't even remember if it had fiction or was strictly sort of history, philosophy, politics, and economics kinds of stuff. And I had this theory in my, you know, this sort of idea in my head that it was probably owned by some old lefties because mm -hmm. it had used in new books and they were heavily leaning towards critical and, and left stuff. And I saw on a shelf a, a book by Eugene Genovese, who was the foremost Marxist historian of the slave South. Later, mm -hmm. he would leave behind Marxism, but he always, yeah, he became, always had became a right way you're eventually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, that's years later from, from this. Mm -hmm. And he, um, and I picked, it was called the political economy of slavery. And I picked it up and I, and I just devoured it sitting there in the bookstore. I thought, wow, this is really good. And it gave me ideas for how to approach my dissertation. I'll just say my dissertation on landlord and peasant relations in Spanish America was titled the political economy of seniorialism, which was mm -hmm. to honor his book. But what happened was it so challenged the work I was, the, the, the framework I was using, the theoretical framework, that I wrote to Genovese and I said, um, here's what I've been doing and I'm finding myself really frustrated. I saw your political economy of slavery. And between sending the letter and hearing back from him, I just was working my way through like in a marathon-like way, all of his book, all of his books. And when he wrote back, he was really blunt. He said, well, for a start, get rid of that Andre Gunder Frank stuff and pick up the British Marxist historians. And he laid out the names. And I and I, I didn't have time to work all the way through that kind of stuff, but I, I sort of reached in and out of it. And, and I really did come to see the degree to which a, a Marxian understanding of history was a class struggle analysis, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, um, where was I going with this? And so this empowered me against sort of the standard thinking about peasants and landlords and so on. It was tough when I came out, as I'm sure you can appreciate stories about hard, hard, hard times for, for academic work. When I came out, it was almost impossible to get a job, period. But it didn't help that I was a Marxist from New York, a Jewish Marxist from New York with a PhD from Louisiana. And I would interview at places and I could see the looks on their faces, you know, it was just really <laughs> remarkable. And eventually I did get a job, but it meant coming back up to the north, obviously. I'm, and I've been, to make the long story short, I've been in Wisconsin, uh, all these, uh, well, I taught at UW-Green Bay for 42, 43 years. And I'm, I, re I retired in the face of the pandemic, not wanting to teach online. I like doing this kind of stuff, but I didn't want to lecture to students. who had No, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. I mean, I do, uh, I do, um, some, you know, sometimes I do still take, uh, you know, I Teaching is not most of what I do at this point, but this mm -hmm. is most of what I do at this point in Jacobin and all that stuff. But the, yeah. uh, but I do still adjunct and I do I do still teach some online classes, but oh. Uh, oh. I like I like in person classes about ten thousand times more because like online teaching basically cuts out the one thing I like about teaching, which is uh, which is being in the classroom. Um, yeah, no, I, right, exactly, exactly. And I, I thought I might go back to teach a bit in, in retirement, but the pandemic lasted so long that I just 
sort of thought, nah, this was this would be more fun. Well, anyhow, so the 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 jump from doing Latin American studies was also going to say, as somebody who has a PhD from uh, the University of Miami, I can identify with some of what you said. But uh, ah, keep, okay, keep, yeah, keep yeah, going, yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, one doesn't realize how regionalized things can be. Uh, you know, the sort of sense of what's respected and 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 dist and all that, all that. Uh, um, so so it always, by the way, it made me. It made me so happy when I finally did get a tenure track job that I basically rarely ever sought to move from out of out of Wisconsin. I just mm -hmm. could not stand the thought of going to a conference with the idea of interviewing. Just even now, well, I, well, I, well, I, I think down. it might be. I will actually say. I mean, I think there might also be a sense in which it was really good that you um, that you were. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, all those years in sort of the same way that like, okay, so a, um, somebody who writes about the Marxist theory of history, I know we have disagreements about, you know, G.A. Cohen. I, I remember thinking at one point, I think I actually said this in, a, in an article somewhere, uh, that uh, like whatever I think he has a really bad take, I always think it's like um, – Man, the guy, the man spent too much time at Oxford. Like, you know, he, uh, you know, he, was, he should have, you know, like, like he, he sort of forgot, you know, the things that he presumably knew growing up in a working class communist family in Montreal. Uh, and, um, and, uh -huh. and I think that, I think that being, you know, being in the upper Midwest and particularly being in Wisconsin, which is the site of some, some like really big labor struggles, uh, in, yeah. um, uh, you know, in, uh, even in like the early 2010s, you know, I mean, I think probably does help keep you grounded in that way of looking at the world. Yeah. Well, in fact, that's, that's a good point. In fact, I'll mention, I'll, I'll come back to the story I was going with in, in, in respond to what I just said. Uh, I actually, I, I actually always wanted to teach at a place like that. I like, like the one I ended up at. Okay. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be in a place. I, I went to all public universities. I never wanted to, teach in a place where students or parents thought they could buy and sell me. That was <laughs> important. Okay. And the other, and the other thing was, well, like this UW Green Bay, by the way, was set up as an inter, as an alternative campus of what was the UW system. So what people may wonder, well, how could you go from Latin America to British, which I'll explain in a moment, and then end up in American studies mm -hmm. for lack of, you know, a, a better term for it. And it's because I was at a school that had an ethos of innovation and experimentation. And though I can't say that anyone else made the leaps that I made when I, I really did have three academic careers, the graduate study years of Latin America, the early years of my acad you know, professorial career doing British Marxists and doing a lot of immersion in European history, which I was not trained in. And, um, and then in the 90s, throwing myself into my childhood hero, Thomas Paine, and mm -hmm. really, really working on American radicalism. All the I, People used to joke, what would I do in the 2000s? It's now 30 years since I really threw myself into the sort of American radical stuff. But yeah. with the jump from, from Latin America truly mm -hmm. into this British Marxist historiography that I knew better then than I know now, but nevertheless had to do with the fact that I had a really good friend who taught at a, a, at St. Cloud State University of Minnesota, where I spent one year. And he was an Althusserian Marxist in literary mm -hmm. criticism. And, and he and I were best buddies. Even now, I haven't seen him in some years, but I still have the warmest feelings about this. Bill Langan is his name in St. Cloud. And we used to have these really, really great arguments about history versus, you know, sort of his, what he called historicism versus structuralism, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he was the organizer. He was like very close friends with Frederick Jameson. And Jameson had asked, asked Bill, would he help organize the Marxist literary group summer, summer Institutes? They were like summer camps for Marxist literary folk. And they lasted about 10 days, two weeks, I guess two weeks. I was there for 10 days that, that one time. And I was so impressed when he told me about the folks who were coming. They would get people from all over the world. And, you know, the year before I got to, to St. Cloud, they had had uh, Terry Eagleton come yeah, to mm -hmm. speak there. And then they, I think I say skipped a year, but the year that he said, Harvey, you got to come back, which was the year I had left and moved to Wisconsin. You got to come back because Stuart Hall was going to speak at the summer Institute, the summer camp, so to speak. And he was going to talk about this big sort of debate underway in Britain where a younger generation of 
Marxist so social scientists were really, for lack of a better word, really going after the generation of Marxist historians that I had this interest mm -hmm. in. And he said, oh, you've got to come and hear Stuart Hall speak. And I thought, absolutely. So I went, I went back to Minnesota, not a big trip, back to Minnesota for the week. And Hall had not yet arrived. And we, I think it was the July 4th fireworks night. We had all gone. There were like 50 people there at, at the time for the camp. And afterward, Bill and Fred Jameson and I and another fellow whose name I'm forgetting were sitting at Bill's kitchen table drinking vodka. Bill taught Russian and French, and he always had a bottle of vodka in the freezer. And the phone rang. So this was probably like midnight or even one in the morning. So in England, it was like seven o'clock in the morning. Sorry, at, in the morning. Mm -hmm. The phone rings and it's Stuart Hall and he's apologizing that he cannot get to the States because budget cuts were taking place. And the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham, which is where so much of this debate had emerged from, they were receiving cuts and he couldn't abandon his colleagues before he left. Not left for the States, but left to take up a professorship at the Open University in Britain. And so the, they hung up the phone and I little was I aware that my friend Bill leaned over to Fred and said, ask Harvey to speak in Stewart's place. Now, I'd never spoken on music. I mean, I had, had I? No, I had not. I had never spoken on in public about this stuff. And, um, and I had too many vodkas to say no, okay? <laughs> and I can't even remember if it was the next day or the day after, because I think I might have had a little time to prepare. It was my turn to speak at 10 a.m. or... Yeah, 10 a.m. on that day or 9 a.m. doesn't matter. But the person who was speaking before me was Gayatri Spivak, mm -hmm. who was like the queen of deconstruction. And she was a post structuralist and she had just returned from Paris. And all she and she was, you know, talking the Derid, Derid, you know, Deridian theory. And they, these folks at the at, of the Summer Institute, they were all structuralists, they were all Althusserians. And when she spoke that one hour, I'm convinced they, they didn't seem, I don't even think they understood what she was saying. Honestly, I do not <laughs> think they understood. I can tell you that I d definitely did not, but also because I was worried and nervous that when I would speak, that I, I would have a tough time with the structuralist. So she spoke, they were very polite in their response to her, either because they were afraid of crossing her or because they really didn't quite grasp what was going on. And then I spoke and and I did a straightforward kind of thing, which is, you know, pretty much what I was about. And I can tell you that I don't remember a single question they asked, but I really felt like I had been spat upon en masse at the end of that talk. And when I got up to leave thinking I, maybe I should just go home to Wisconsin as quickly as possible, Fred Jameson grabbed me. Keep in mind, Jameson was definitely a sort of, sort of a Frankfurt School Marxist, in, in, at least mm -hmm. in those days. And mm -hmm. he grabbed me and said, I really liked your talk. If you write it up, I'd like to publish it in social text. I don't know if he was the publisher of social text, I, but the point was he, he was the, the godfather of the whole enterprise. Well, I got back to Wisconsin and I spent the year. I didn't really do anything with it. But that summer following, sorry about this long story, but no, I love it. following, I was accepted into a summer, a summer institute of the National Endowment for the Humanities at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And the theme was labor and the industrial revolution. Mm. And it was chaired by a really fine historian, a, a one who had made the linguistic turn, uh, Bill Sewell Jr. And when I got there, it, I was so excited to be there. It was really a great group of people, men and women. Bill made it a point on our first day, officially um, as part of the group, to meet with each one of us one by one. And when I met with him, he said to me, he said, "Would you mind if I propose an alternative to your summer project that you uh, that you were that you had proposed?" And I said, "Well, sure." He said, "Well, I know you want to do Welsh labor history readings, and that had to do with the fact that my wife, who was British, her family came out of you know one link of her family was in the coal mines of Wales; the other was actually Scottish side of the family. They were carpenters, but." He suggested, "Why don't you? I've heard something about you're doing this British Marxist historian's work." why don't you just write that up this summer? And yeah. I thought, wow, that'd be great. Cause I was already, you know, sort of in the process. And at the end of the summer, when I finished the, the essay, the paper, 
and I delivered it to the group. Afterward, he pulled me aside. I was young, by the way. I was very young at the time. I was maybe 30, 79, 30, 30 years old, I think it was, in mm -hmm. fact, and probably. He pulls me aside and he says, you know, that paper is just inadequate. And I said, oh, God, what's wrong? He goes, it really ought to be a book. <laughs> so I came back to Green Bay and I was in the library and on the shelf of the new bookshelves, they had this group of books, Theoretical Traditions in the Social Sciences. And I, I pulled a few of them off and they were all being edited, you know, sort of, what do they call this, a series editor, it's Anthony Giddens, who at the time was the foremost English language social theorist, and he was at Cambridge University. And, and I thought, wow, you know, I'm going to submit it for publication somewhere, but, you know, I think I'll just send it, I'll ask him, what do you think of this? So I sent it off to the Canadian, re the paper, to the Canadian Review of Sociology and Anthropology, which eventually did publish it, didn't they? Yeah, pretty, yeah, it did. Okay, it's a long time ago. And Bill, not Bill, uh, um, Tony sent me a letter and said, you'll be hearing from my publisher if you'd like to do a book. And next thing I knew, I had this contract to write this book on the British Marxist historian. So I literally, I mean, I, it, my work on Latin America is in there. People will see regarding the transition from feudalism to capitalism. If they pick up the book, they'll see that. But what's more significant is that I literally f flipped. I mean, I just switched. And I spent the 80s and many years after in certain ways as the historiographer mm -hmm. of the British Marxists. And it, it really was an adventure in part because it was I had to learn things I knew nothing about regarding British history much of which I've probably forgotten since. But to meet those historians was itself nothing that I had expected to happen. And, mm. you know, so I, I met Rodney Hilton, the medievalist, uh, Christopher Hill, uh, who's the master of the 17th century, um, E.P. Thompson, who I, clearly one of the, truly a, one of the great, maybe the greatest social historian for my generation, his his the influence of his one book, The Making of the English Working Class, on my generation mm -hmm. is, is just just amazing. And then I ended up also meeting, though this was a few years later. I'll tell quickly Eric Hobsbawm, who every, everyone knows, I think, who Eric Hobsbawm is, probably the one of the greatest historians of the 20th century, definitely the greatest Marxist historian of the 20th century. He um I had written to him hoping to meet him and I thought he would be the one I would connect with the most readily. And he, and it turned out that he would not meet with me. Uh, he, he actually wrote a letter, which I have nearby. And I, I remember telling people, he basically said I should treat him as if he's dead. And I said that to Eric when I eventually did meet him. He goes, I didn't put it, say that, did I? I said, well, you said I should treat you like Frederick Jackson Turner. Okay. <laughs> you know, somebody who, who, who I don't have to worry about having any, any kind of response from. Well, what happened was, in the course of all this, I also became very close to a historian, George Rudet, okay, who worked both on British history and French history, a really phenomenal figure who taught in, in, in Britain, in, in uh, Australia, and in Canada, and probably the finest, finest teacher of his generation, just remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I became the, and to make the long story short, I became the executor of his estate, but George was so was always very very he and Edward he and Eric Hobbs were always very close very very close um and I also ended up meeting and ended up editing several of not I shouldn't exactly three volumes of his writings Victor Kiernan who was part of the group but worked on British imperialism and then a whole host of other things and the two historians of the group that Hobbs remained the closest to in the course of the 60s 70s 80s 90s were those two historians, Kieran and Ruday, and they basically told Eric, you have got to meet Harvey. So I did end up meeting Eric, and we stayed in contact till the end of his life. And, and, and by the way, Eric, Edward, Christopher, the three of them came to Green Bay. They came to the United States to give a lecture tour, so to speak, give lectures. And they came to Green Bay to visit, spoke to my students. They were all remarkable, George Ruday as well. And um, Hobsbawm and I just, that was, I wish I could have, re remember he and I took a long walk in the woods one afternoon and we were talking about why he had not let, sorry, I'm leaving out so much of who these men were. 
the British Marxist historians basically went to university in the 30s during the Depression and joined the Communist yeah. Party. Yeah, so there the, there was, there was, this like, was originally like the Communist Party historians group. Right. right, and then when they returned from the war, they formed the Communist Party historians group, along with a number of other uh, you know, historians famous and, and, and not so famous in, in the future. Mm -hmm. And their ambitions were basically to rewrite the story of England and Britain from, in their, in their words, from a Marxist perspective from and from the vantage point of the laboring classes, mm -hmm. whether we're talking peasants, artisans, and workers. Okay? Yeah, the, the people Whatever. the people that in like Marx's terminology and in, in capital, the immediate producers of, of any society. Right, the exploited. Yeah. The exploited. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>